Okay, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Um, for our next keynote speech, it uh, gives me great pleasure to welcome to the stage the Right Honourable Grant Shapps, MP, Secretary of State for Energy, Security and Net Zero, who will be exploring unleashing innovation for a net zero future, and will then take some questions from the audience. So, um, as before, if you'd like to put those through on Slido during the speech, then you can, or um, we'll have the roving microphones uh, as before as well. Um, Secretary of State, please, if you'd, um, if you'd like to come to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, indeed, and good afternoon. And uh, I was reminded, uh, just as I was coming out here, that I'm largely in front of both a scientific and a housing uh, audience here. And I, I was reminded that I'm probably the longest standing housing minister in post uh, in the last two decades. I did the job for uh, two and a half uh, years, and it is an industry which is absolutely vital to uh, the future of our uh, nation. But today, I wanted to sort of address you on some of the scientific uh, questions, particularly those which arise from uh, energy security uh, and uh, our drive to both build a bigger economy, uh, but also to, to make life better for people. And I was struck by the extent to which, over the last few years, five years ago, for example, uh, people have been talking about science as if it's come to a standstill. The Atlantic magazine asked 93 of the world's most em eminent physicists to rate the importance of Nobel Prize winning discoveries from the 20th century. And the result of the article actually made waves in itself. Some of you would be familiar. The physicists all agreed that the period between 1910 and the 1930s, when general relativity, quantum mechanics were transforming our understanding of how the universe itself actually works, was a golden scientific age. But they were equally convinced that innovation had declined after the Second World War and that it continues to decline until this day. And despite vast increases in time and money spent on scientific research, concluded Atlantic Magazine, science is getting less bang for its buck. And Scientific or Atlantic Magazine wasn't the only one uh, to signal that there was an end to the trailblazing era of scientific breakthroughs. The journal Nature also reported that the pace of science and innovation had slowed in the past 75 years. Indeed, Stanford University published a paper, Are Scientific Ideas Getting Harder to Find? Uh, Scientific America ran a whole series of articles, Is Science Hitting a Brick Wall? And Forbes ran an article actually just this January, which was headlined, Where Are All the Scientific Breakthroughs? Now, I'm no scientific boffin, uh, but even I uh, seen and noticed some momentous, science, some momentous scientific breakthroughs just in recent years. We've witnessed gravitational waves, for example, ripples of fabric in space-time. We've proved that dark matter really does exist and discover plentiful water on Mars, and we've seen galaxies that existed just in relative time 320 million years after the Big Bang, which is, cosmo cosmologically speaking, a very short period of time. We've even generated human tissue and heart tissue out of adult skin cells. We've made bionic limbs. We've developed vaccines in double-quick time through COVID. In fact, it seems to me that never has science been more profoundly important than it is today. And that rather than suffering some existential crisis, as all those headlines suggest. In fact, science is the only solution, the only solution to the single biggest problem that we all face today, which is what happens to the world if we can't get a grip of climate change itself. And so today, what I wanted to do is just to spend a few moments saying why I'm still optimistic about finding solutions to the future problems, including climate change, that we face. And to provide some perspective to that challenge, I wanted to set out this fact. The world's electricity consumption has tripled in the space between 1980 and 2021. And that's just the start, because we also know that the global population itself is expected to grow by a further 2 billion people 
in the next 30 years. So how are we going to power all that growth? Well, I have to say again, the answer is through science. We know, we know that our future health, security, prosperity depends on us decarbonizing, and yet somehow we still have to continue to grow our economies to support all those new people. So we need science today more than we've ever needed it in the past. We need to unleash the creativity and the enterprise that we've seen in this country before, and we need to make Britain a green energy leader. Now, there was one giant leap missing from my list of uh, 21st century scientific accomplishments, and that really took place two years ago at a laboratory in Abingdon in a project called JET. And it's the most powerful operational nuclear fusion machine in the world. I suspect some people in this room were involved in it. It set new records by producing 50 my, 59 megajoules of energy, energy over five seconds, and it proved that sustained fusion power is possible by using exactly the same type of energy-making processes as used in the sun. The experiment demonstrated that we can affect crater mini star here on the Earth, even if it only lasted for a few seconds. And JET has now produced over 103,000 of these it pulses and temporarily makes, when it's running, in that part of Oxfordshire, the hottest place in the solar system. Uh, as I noted when I visited there with the Prime Minister uh, back in March, launching the Powering Up Britain uh, publication and standing right next to the tokamak. As I joked to the Prime Minister, it proved that it isn't the case that politicians can produce more hot air than the sun. <laughs> of course, the challenge to deliver fusion uh, energy uh, is huge, uh, but it actually offers near limitless power, uh, safe, carbon-free, uh, and it could be working we hope not before too long. And JET has taught us so much, that project itself. Um, but it's now actually 40 years old since it's been running. And we've build, been building a new generation of fusion facilities uh, here in the UK, including, very excitingly, plans for the world's first civil fusion power plant in Nottinghamshire. And just as Britain led the world with Calder Hall, the world's first nuclear power station uh, uh, in 1956. Based here in uh, the UK, on a UK design, this new centre is called STEP, uh, which stands for Spherical Tokamak for Energy Production, and it's shaped like a core of an apple. It will produce uh, powerful magnet magnetic fields, uh, and uh, it will allow that those fields to confine themselves uh, and the hot plasma uh, of fusion fuels. Uh, when I went there, Sir Ian Chapman explained how it prevent the walls of the entire structure melting itself down through those magnetic fields. So we're setting up a company called Industrial Fusion Solutions. We're working with industry and academia uh, to build globally uh, this unique fusion center right here in the UK with global expertise. And I'm excited to announce today that the UK Atomic Energy Authority will collaborate with Dell with Intel, with the University of Cambridge, to develop a virtual prototype of that eventually planned to be built plant. And they'll explore how AI and supercomputers, making up to one quintillion of calculations per second, can produce a digital swing of that step design and develop an immersive virtual environment known as an industrial metaverse, uh, the digital twin which will allow us to speed up the progress towards delivering electricity to our grid in 2040s from fusion. And that, folks, is exactly the kind of science superpower partnership that we want to make a reality through fusion. And fusion has that potential to provide dispatchable base load power uh, complementing renewables like wind and solar, which are not as helpful when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. It also promises to revolutionize our energy production uh, for countries who perhaps don't have the ability uh, to produce other types of power, renewable or otherwise, or where perhaps nuclear fission, which is conventional nuclear, isn't appropriate for those uh, places. So we're investing £700 million uh, to make the UK an absolute hub for this fusion technology uh, with the regulatory framework in place and investors, plan, uh, investors can plan with, with great confidence. Now, I'm well aware for the physicists in the room 
of that long-running joke. If you ever ask a physicist when we'll see fusion power, they will always tell you it's about 20 years away. It doesn't matter when you ask that question, uh, but we intend to spoil that punchline once and for all uh, through this digital twin uh, and through this work to actually develop the world's first civil fusion uh, power station. And so confident uh, are we in doing that, that there is an option down on a power station that closed just this spring, uh, which was a coal-powered station, which should be the first coal to fusion power station in the world, and it will be in the UK. In the meantime, though, I'd say it's full steam ahead uh, with our energy program, uh, and that means we're weaning ourselves off those fossil fuels. Uh, we're replacing them with green energy generated in Britain. Uh, we are cutting bills, and actually I'm pleased to say this Saturday, everyone will see a reduction in their bill of about £460 a year, about 17%. Uh, and we're improving our energy security post Putin's illegal invasion, which caused that huge energy spike, and I have to say inflation spike, off the back of it. And that's why my new department, which was only created in February, wasted no time at all. I think it was 50 days before it published Powering Up Britain, that document I mentioned, which describes the entire ecosystem for our new energy uh, system with pioneering breakthrough technologies involved. Um, and we're already getting well ahead on that. For example, it's a little known fact, but the UK is the country in the world with the largest offshore wind farms. And we don't just have the first largest, we have the second largest, the third largest, and the fourth largest wind farm offshore in the entire world. We were the country that developed the first uh, offshore floating wind farm. And we've got plans for more in the Celtic Sea, in Cornwall, and in Wales, and off Scotland as well. And we're amongst the top five nations in the world, globally, for carbon capture, utilization, and storage, which is a process which separates the CO2 uh, from industry, and then stores it permanently locked into the basin of, in our case, the North Sea. It's an enormous opportunity. Having spent years digging oil and gas out of the North Sea, we can fill the exact same holes and some other aquifers with CO2 and store it permanently. And I asked my scientists, well, how much space have we got? And they explained, there's enough space, Minister, for 78 billion tons. I don't know about you, but I kind of find it hard to picture what 78 billion tons of CO2 might look like, but they've helpfully told me in the speech it's the equivalent to 15 and a half million well-nourished elephants. <laughs> so now you know. If I were able to fill all of that uh, space with carbon dioxide, if we could do that, to put it another way, we would be able to uh, fill it with sufficient uh, uh, emissions, which would be the equivalent, given that we have a trading scheme for emissions, of about five trillion pounds of carbon stored away. It's enough space to store all of our carbon, 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 uh, carbon since the, <laughs> which is not a bad idea now, I think. <laughs> Uh, carbon since uh, the Industrial Revolution, or all of Europe's for the next 100 years. I think you're getting the idea the size of this opportunity is absolutely enormous, even without storing carbon. Uh, aside from fusion, of course, we've got our conventional fission uh, nuclear power stations. Uh, Sizewell C is going to be built immediately after Hinkley Point uh, C is complete. I've been to see it. It's the space of 250 football pitches, and it will produce more electricity than any other nuclear reactor in the world, and then size will see we'll do the same thing again. We've got our hydrogen uh, package, which could produce 12,000 jobs, uh, in, uh, attract 11 billion pounds of investment, and be a way of storing some of that energy that comes through the renewables, that when we don't need it at night, it can be stored into hydrogen, used in many other ways. Our intention is to produce 10 gigawatts of hydrogen by the end of this decade. And since February, I've been around the world talking about a lot of these things in Japan, in Korea, in the Middle East, in the United States, and across Europe. And I can tell you, wherever I go, it is clear that people consider us to have a formidable lead because we've been at these technologies for a longer time than elsewhere. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why we're ranked uh, as the uh, top three, as a top three country globally uh, for places to invest in clean energy. And just last week, and you may have missed it, but I actually did it here at the QE2 Center, I announced millions of pounds out of a billion pound net zero innovation fund to help us to harvest the power of solar from space and beam it down to Earth via 
radio waves. To the scientists in the room, this is just bread and butter stuff. To the rest of us, this is absolutely extraordinary. But we reckon that if this technology can be proven through the money that I've just provided, that it could power as much as three quarters of homes in Britain by 2050. It's an enormous opportunity for space-based solar uh, uh, farms powering us here on Earth. And we're going to make sure that we provide capital to back all of these different ideas and technologies and crowd in uh, funding uh, from uh, the private markets as well. And that's why I recently updated our green finance strategy and uh, where the government can provide billions of pounds, which we're doing, for example, with the carbon capture and storage, 20 billion pounds alone, I'm very aware that the private sector can leverage in trillions of pounds to the process. So we're going to use all of these resources. We're going to generate more private finance for green tech. And this is, after all, a huge opportunity commercially and perhaps the biggest one facing us in many generations too. So to sum up, um, science, I think, is still the hearting beat, the, the beating heart of investments. It is right at the center of everything that we need to do when it comes to innovation and technology, as I've discussed today. It's the catalyst for our entire strategy. I don't think we can do this without science being right at its heart. And I think we are on the verge of a huge, big energy transition and re revolution, another industrial revolution. And once again, I think that Britain can drive that uh, transition. We have world-beating tech companies, many in the room today. We've worked world-beating engineers, again, many in the room today. We've got world-beating uh, universities, four of the top ten in the world. We've got that incredible resource of the North Sea that I talked about. Our position outside of the EU has some advantages when it comes to getting on with things like fusion and creating a business-friendly environment for some of these technologies. And more than two centuries after burning fossil fuels that damage our planet, uh, and after years of gloomy headlines of these slowing down scientific discoveries, we now have the chance uh, to be amongst the first nations to gain a real competitive advantage in some truly remarkable technologies, producing safe, cheap, and abundant zero carbon power, which is our objectives. So, far from, far from science being in crisis, hitting a brick wall, short of ideas, I'd say that when it comes to the energy transition itself and energy security, it's science that will make Britain an energy superpower nation. And that could be part of our energy mix for the next 200 years. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Secretary of State, thank you. Um, thank you for agreeing as well to, um, to answer a few questions sure. um, for us today. Uh, we've already had many come in on, on Slido. Uh, I just wanted to pick up with you first, if we can, um, the, the new report from the Climate Change Committee, um, which doesn't make entirely reassuring reading. The, the committee uh, uh, says that it's increasingly doubtful that the 2030 net zero um, targets will be met. I was interested first in just getting your reaction to those concerns. And, and given that the committee says it would like to mm -hmm. see ministers regrouping, wants to see a bolder delivery, um, what would you say to reassure that, that government is standing by those pledges? Yeah, I mean, first of all, we need to get to net zero by 2050, not 2030. So we've, we're not, it's not six years, it's, it's still uh, halfway through the century. The second thing I'd say is, uh, look, we've set out a series of carbon budgets which get us to net zero by 2050 a target for which I'm legally responsible to Parliament. In fact, I'm probably the only cabinet minister uh, who uh, um, could legally, technically go to prison if I didn't meet the targets. I could be in contempt of court for not setting out a serious plan. I mentioned this to the cabinet the other month and they, uh, they didn't look like they were trying to help me all that much. So I don't know where, quite where they were coming from. Um, but, uh, but, but the fact of the matter is, if you look at the record, we met our carbon... The, the getting there is set out in carbon budgets, as many of you will know. We've met our first carbon budget, it exceeded it. We've met and exceeded the second, met and exceeded the third. We're on track for the fourth and fifth. The sixth, we're within shouting distance of, which takes us through to 2037. So, yes, I think the Committee for Climate Change, which, after all, we set up to hold our feet to the fire is doing what you'd expect a committee to do that holds your feet to the fire and say, come on, guys, you've got to go further and faster, and we're grateful for their, 
for their work. But as I was explaining in the speech, uh, we've made enormous steps. I didn't mention in my speech. But whereas 10 years ago, we were generating nearly 40% of our electricity from coal, the dirtiest form of hydrocarbons of all, uh, this year it will be virtually zero, virtually none. There's only one coal-powered power, uh, station left, and uh, it barely ever runs. So, you know, we've gone from 40% to zero all during the lifetime of this government. We've made better progress than any other G7 nation. I'm confident we'll carry on doing that. And so, as you say, committee concerns welcome because they're holding your feet to the fire, but you think perhaps overblown? Well, look, the committee uh, report today uh, sort of took the view that the way to get through this is to discourage people from flying, uh, to stop people eating meat. Uh, I presume, presume to have not people have uh, people drive around and, and, and certainly to stop hydrocarbons being dug out of the North Sea. The, the reason I think all these things are uh, the, the wrong route to, to, to go is um, the, the focus should be on uh, getting to technologies which give us uh, essentially guilt-free flying, Jet Zero. Um, and I, four years ago, I set up the Jet Zero Council, which brings together academia, government, business, and in developing things like the sustainable aviation fuel and even synthetic fuel. I went to see a company this weekend called Zero Petroleum, uh, who are at Vista, uh, and literally take air and water, and through a process uh, combined with carbon, produce uh, jet fuel. And I, I've got a vial of jet fuel like this that, that they gave me. These are technologies the British government's supporting. And I think the solution, as I was trying to stress in my speech, to these problems is through technology, not through going away and living in caves. And so I, you know, I think I've got a more optimistic view, a sort of a bright green view of the future rather than a dark green view of the future, you, you, you might describe it. And I'm absolutely confident this country is the right place to develop these technologies. Uh, and I, I hope I drew out some of the reasons why when I was speaking before. Um, we've had lots of questions uh, from the audience on Slido. I'm going to pick, um, we'll have, we have far more than we'll have time to ask. So I'm going to pick those that have been upvoted by other members of the audience um, and seem to be the most popular, uh, which starts with um, a lack of grid capacity uh, and flexibility is seriously blocking growth in the Oxford Cambridge region, especially Harwell. Uh, what can be done about yeah. this? Yeah, grid, grid capacity is a genuine uh, problem that clearly people in the room recognize that we've got to because we have moved so fast on this transition that I was talking about with the example of coal before to electricity uh, that suddenly we're in a situation where in the next six years we need to build about five times the amount of grid capacity links uh, as we've done since the 1990s. I mean, it's, it's at that level of extreme. Um, so I, I've just had a, a report done for me. It's just landed on my desk, actually, about how we go about dramatically speeding up those uh, grid connections. We want to, for example, uh, where people want to bring in uh, uh, wind power, we want to halve the permissioning time, the permitting time, uh, the build time, uh, where people have got uh, new projects, for example, you know, solar panels and you want to get them into the grid. We want to make that a fast and convenient thing to do. Uh, we're looking at, to, for example, scrap permitted development rights, which limit one megawatt on a commercial property, uh, after which point you have to start to get planning permission. I don't see why we should have a limit at all. No one's ever written to me to complain about solar panels being on someone's, you know, on a roof somewhere, on an Amazon roof or whatever. So I think there are a lot of practical things we can do, and, and uh, I've, I've just, re just in receipt or about to receive a report uh, which is going to describe that, and, and we intend to act on that stuff pretty quickly. Um, you bring up the permitted development rights there. Uh, another guest from the audience has asked, um, how can the government ease planning policy to facilitate development of real estate mm. that then allows scientific discovery? Yeah, I think, uh, so having been in the planning world before as a, as a housing minister, and this is genuinely one of the biggest challenges facing our country. It's pretty obvious why. You know, we're getting up to 70 million people. We live on a relatively small island. And yet, actually, when I remind my colleagues that we've only built on probably 14, 15% of the entire land, I mean, everything, not just homes or not just commercial, you, you actually start to realise, actually, that's not out of proportion to you know, the country as a whole. I think it's very important to get development which is um, uh, spread across the economic benefits for the whole country rather than cramming it all into one corner of the country. I think that's important. I also think it's important to make sure that planning rules are clear. So, you know... Uh, we should have plans in place which, as people who want to develop, 
whether it's you know, units for scientific discovery or, or homes, you should know that basically if you go and develop over here, that has been virtually pre-agreed and you can kind of go ahead and do that. And you have, sure, you have to do your, you know, make sure that it, it, it's the correct standard or whatever, but you don't have to go through this endless round and round and round in circle battle uh, to, 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 to get to the planning commission. Particularly in energy projects, which is currently my area, uh, we, we're seeing decisions come through faster. In, indeed, actually a decision, which I won't go into detail because it's still open to challenge, but there's a decision this week which has actually come through ahead of time ahead of the deadline, which is the sort of thing I'd like to see happening across uh, real estate development more generally. Interesting question here uh, on taxes. Um, property taxes don't incentivize net zero carbon like road tax does. Mm. Could the government consider taxing building carbon emissions instead of rateable value? Mm. It's a very interesting question that probably without answering off the top of my head and upsetting the chancellor I better take away and consider in more detail but I think it's a very interesting point uh, and I know that um, Treasury are always looking at different ways to raise the necessary revenues uh, and balance it against the wider objectives uh, so the simple answer for clarity is I have no idea if that's what the chancellor is thinking I'll certainly undertake to talk to him about it what I do know is the chancellor has actually worked with us to implement a program of reducing uh, or improving our energy efficiency and reducing our energy needs by 15%. Uh, and, of course, we need policies to help deliver uh, that. So I'll throw this into the pot for him as a, as a useful idea. Excellent. And I know, I know you had about uh, five minutes, so I'll squeeze just one more question in, um, if I can. And that is, in, in your role overseeing energy security and net zero, which UK companies excite you the most at the moment for our future? Huh. You've, given, you've given us an interesting example. Yeah, that, I think that, that, that zero petroleum company is fascinating. You're taking air and water uh, and through a process which involves a lot of electricity, which of course has got to be renewable, otherwise the whole thing is <laughs> pointless. Uh, those type of things are very exciting. I think what the UK Atomic Energy Authority are doing, and actually they only deal with the fusion side of things, and I described at length in my speech, so I won't detail more, is absolutely fascinating because at the end, fusion power uh, would be you know, the ultimate dream. Uh, and, and, and many of these ideas like uh, bringing power down from space, which sound literally space age discoveries, are actually much closer to reality than most people would uh, think likely uh, because the technical uh, possibility is, is, is already there. Um, and, and, and the big point I'd make actually, especially to a room perhaps a half or a third full of scientists, is we should never limit our ambitions on these things. I mean, strangely, um, you, you know, even uh, Einstein thought that it would be impossible to uh, utilise nuclear power in a way that could be used for civil uh, energy. Uh, but in fact, uh, we, we cracked those, those, those problems. And now a new generation, which I'll end on, which is small modular reactors, uh, the sort of thing that Rolls-Royce and others are developing, uh, provide the uh, potential for us to uh, be able to uh, create energy a bit closer to communities, but at a scale that would really help with our energy security and energy mix and wouldn't be dependent on whether it's sunny or, 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 uh, or the wind's blowing. So I think there are, I, I, of all your questions, this is the one I struggle with most because there are so many excellent possibilities out there. I'll end on my dream, which is one day we should be able to abolish the Department of Energy Security because energy would be so abundant and frankly so cheap that uh, you no longer literally have to have a you know, Department of State to look after these things. Secretary of State, thank you so much for your, for your time. Um, you if you're happy to. From Channel 4's climate fight. I hear. When are you going to unblock the cheapest, cleanest form of power, which is on, uh, onshore wind, which is currently blocked by a de facto planning? You've talked about how important it is to relax planning on other energy schemes. When are you going to do it for onshore wind? Good to see you, Hugh. Uh, I, um, I <laughs> always a pleasure. Um, look, there isn't actually, as you know, just technically, there is no ban on onshore wind. But hold, I, let me finish the sentence. Let me finish the sentence. One turbine built in the last seven years because of a day factory. Let me finish the sentence. There is no actual ban, although, as you rightly say, at the moment, it has led to fewer uh, or very few new turbines going up. But uh, we've already said, uh, so you've asked when, and the answer is we already have said that we intend to change the National Planning Policy Framework, a document many people in this room will know, the MPPF, uh, to make it clear 
that where communities want these uh, turbines, they can have these turbines. And for your information, I'd be, I've met with my colleagues on both sides of this uh, pretty hotly debated uh, subject uh, who both say they want to see it um, sold, and we all agree that where communities want them, they should be able to have them. It's worth just putting this issue into context. I think I'm right in saying, although it may be quite marginal now, but if you take the three great suppliers of renewable energy, which are solar, onshore wind, and offshore wind, onshore wind is still probably just our biggest source of renewable energy at about 14 gigawatts. So this country does not do badly uh, on onshore wind. Uh, and I, I take your point, uh, but we do need to make sure, as with all developments, and I think it's in everybody's interest to do this, that we do it in a way that takes the community and the public with us. And that's what I intend to do with our policy. Thank Hugh, you. Any, Hugh, any follow-up? Yeah. <laughs> Don't encourage him. <laughs> Thank you very much. I mean, you had a very, very damning report from the Climate Change Committee today. They say there is no leadership. They're incredibly worried about you meeting almost all of your targets for net zero. You breezed in here today and said you've got it all under control, but you've hit the targets in the past. Past targets are very different from future targets. And the body who you specifically tasked with working out how you're doing, has said you're not making progress. You've made less progress in the past year than you did in the previous year, and you're really lacking in leadership, and you're way off the pace. And yet you've given us a very bullish statement today, saying you're really confident. The rest of the country is not confident, and we're really worried that you're just not achieving what you set out to do, and you've got no really credible plan for net zero. Well, Hugh, I think you should start by saying what you really mean. Uh, <laughs> no, look, I, it's, it's a, it's, <laughs> look, I, look, I agree, but let me speak on behalf of the other uh, lots of people. I think what people in this country want is energy security. We've seen how we've been caught up with the war in Ukraine, what that did to people's energy bills, and by the way, we were paying half of people's energy bills this last winter, but it won't have felt that way because energy bills still were going up so much. So you'll accept that there is a balance that a Secretary of State has to meet between keeping the lights on and keeping the energy affordable and getting to net zero, which, as I mentioned in my previous answer, I'm legally accountable for. And you say that I sort of come in here sort of in a breezy way. Look, I don't, I don't agree with you. I am an optimist by nature. That, that is true. But I'm also capable of looking at our track record and pointing out that people were sceptical that we'd meet carbon budget one, two, and three. And we didn't just meet them. We exceeded them. And I'm only 6% away in our reckoning from meeting carbon budgets up to 2037, and that's before you factor in some of these great uh, technologies uh, which can help us uh, get there, which is why I'm so enthusiastic about them. So uh, if you want my opinion, then we'll have to wait till then to know for sure, but we're going to reach it. Uh, we're going to make it. In fact, I think we'll probably exceed where we thought we'll, uh, we, we'd, we'd get to. Uh, and you know, I've been proud to lead that transition. I've been banging on about electric cars. I've driven one for four years. I've had solar panels on my roof for 12 years. You know, I, 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 I've been encouraging this transition. I set up the Jet Zero Council uh, in order to, in aviation, get through um, this transition. But I also believe that people have a right to live their lives and to do so at a, a, a standard of living, a quality uh, of life, which I think that people who think that the answer is just to switch off all our oil and gas resources and then actually perversely buy it from abroad, because you'll still have to heat your home and put petrol in cars which aren't electric, are absolutely along the wrong tracks. This is the Just Stop Oil plan, which would end up meaning we import twice the carbon and become even more reliant on tyrants like Putin. So I just reject that approach to this problem. And I speak, I think, on behalf of the vast majority. I know you claim to speak on behalf of a lot of people. I think I speak on behalf, and I'm elected to do this, the vast majority of people who want a sensible energy security plan, which also gets us to net zero. And that is what I would argue I'm doing. The clue is in the name of my department or name of my title, which is Secretary of State for Energy Security and Net Zero. Flip sides of the same coin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for the question, George.